Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me from Central Tennessee is my friend Joe Ricky. Joe, how you doing? I'm doing great, Chris. It's a, uh, a pleasure to be here. In fact, I was actually listening to your episode with Gary Gallagher on Bruce Catton. Uh, I guess in secret, the, the Tennessee campaign, the Western theater guy, has a real uh, fascination with Bruce Catton. So. <laughs> Hard to deny. He's a good storyteller, good writer. It's easy to to get uh, enamored with his work. That's for sure. So so, uh, for folks who don't know Joe, he's a historian with the Battle of Franklin Trust in Franklin, Tennessee, and has a particular interest in the incident at Spring Hill. Is that the is that the best way to refer to it? Incident at Spring Hill? I think battle events of the the eight-hour period in Spring Hill that a <laughs> lot of crazy things go down. So, and and to me, the story of Spring Hill, which really sets up the Battle of Franklin, which comes the day after, um, is fascinating because of what does and doesn't happen, and the personalities involved. And um, I thought, you know what, I want to talk to Joe about this because this is great stuff, and nobody knows it better. So, uh, so give us just a quick rundown, for folks who aren't familiar with how important spring hill is um give us the 30 second version and then we'll get into it in a little bit more detail after that i think if you're going to stand a fighting chance at understanding the battle of franklin you have to understand what happened in those hours and uh, really the day before at spring hill it's this uh incredible seizure and and just absolute kind of crystallization of the confederate command structure it just seizes up uh, and then you've got the federal army doing things that are just so out of character for a guy like John Schofield, who was this kind of meticulous and methodical engineer, kind of rolling the dice and taking a chance. Uh, it's a story of, uh, it's a story that, that first of all is, is centered around the, the kind of the Confederate initiative that offensive into Tennessee that pushed towards blocking the Columbia Turnpike on the 29th and and finally maybe being able to capture Nashville and then at the same time you don't want to reduce it to the story of a, a lucky escape of an army either it, it is an incredible series of events that unfold over that day and night of the 29th into the 30th and of course it it certainly offers us one of the most tantalizing what ifs which we'll get in because because of the way things do turn out, uh, people are always like, oh, well, what if this had happened? Because there really is a, a huge lost opportunity for the Confederates at, at Spring Hill. So this all takes place as, as Hood is pushing up into central Tennessee. He's got his eye on Nashville, trying to dislodge federal forces. And how is it that he ends up kind of playing cat and mouse with John Schofield along the way? Well, so Hood takes command of the Army, of course, in the middle of the Atlanta campaign, July 17th of 64. And by September the 1st, he is forced to abandon the city. He retreats south. Uh, there is the series of conversations and meetings that he'll have with both Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, and PGT Beauregard, his department superior. Uh, and one of the things that Hood sort of very early on begins to contemplate is an offensive. And if you could for a moment think of how Jefferson Davis is perceiving an offensive being put on the table in late 1864. He's been on the back foot for the better part of a year. Lee's stuck around Petersburg. The Department of the Trans-Mississippi is all but essentially out of the war. The Department of Alabama is responding to the threat in Mobile. Confederate defenses on the coast are getting ready for Sherman's army. And here comes Hood with this idea of as he said, uh, or as Davis would later say, bringing the Army of Tennessee to allow them to place their feet firmly in the soil of Tennessee. I mean, my God, if you're Jeff Davis, this is like an early Christmas gift. Uh, Hood wants to go on the offensive. And over the course of the coming days and weeks in September and pushing into October, in fact, uh, October 22nd, Hood will go and tell the Army what their objective is, that they're going to march into Tennessee. Now, what's the end goal for Hood? I think it's simply to draw out the war, drag it out, um, outlast the November election, which of course he won't do, uh, and then try and see how much longer he can maybe lure Sherman away from the coast, maybe pull some troops away from Grant at, at, at in Richmond. If he could take his army into Tennessee, 
his eyes are set on Nashville, which of course could replace all of the material losses of Atlanta, and then some, and then that gives him access into Kentucky. His home state, certainly a, maybe a minor factor in all of that, but Kentucky's neutrality since 1861 had been violated. It hadn't seceded. It had been that security blanket for Tennessee throughout the beginning portion of the war, but then that's gone by 62. Now Hood's talking about going into Kentucky and that great uh, quote that Davis gives on a speech on his way back to Richmond as they'll plant their flags on the banks of the Ohio. Uh, he says, uh, and they'll, they'll tell the Yankees, speak not for we'll teach you another lesson. Well, Hood's army is on the move. And it's in due time that Sherman would read one of those speeches and say to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Hood's army crosses the Tennessee River on the 21st, and Sherman had dispatched George Thomas to tend to Tennessee and leave Tennessee in his tender care. Thomas gets to Nashville, starts to take command of the Department of the Cumberland, bring in troops from East Tennessee, West Tennessee, started to try and build the defenses. And as he's mustering and gathering troops, Sherman also sends John Schofield, uh, commander of the 23rd Corps of the Army of the Ohio, to get in front of Hood, simply slow him down by Hood, by Thomas time in Nashville to get the army ready. And John Schofield and John Bell Hood, similarities abound. 33, both graduate from West Point, same class, 1853. They know each other, they're roommates, they're friends, they're classmates, on and on. And yet they're completely different men. And now their two armies collide just to the south of us in Columbia, but it's in the series of cat and mouse kind of games between John Schofield and his chief of cavalry, James Harrison Wilson. And of course, Forrest Cavalry Corps commander, Nathan Bedford Forrest, these two will, I mean, it's, it's really Wilson arrives and he's automatically on the back foot. He's trying to organize a cavalry army out of thin air. He's got Hatch's division and Croxton's men and Horace Capron's brigade. And, and everybody's just kind of sh spread out across middle Tennessee. And Wilson automatically is playing a game of catch up from the second he gets on the ground until then. And he, of course, the job of a cavalry is eyes and ears of the army, but also to protect the main body. And Wilson is doing a hell of a job kind of playing on one foot trying to stop Forrest from finding and probing around the army in the same way Forrest is doing the same almost admirable job of stopping uh, Wilson from finding the main body of Hood's army and figuring out how these two armies eventually collide in Columbia after two and three days of really arduous cavalry campaigning. Uh, I mean, you're talking about horsemen having to ride the better part of 20 and 30 miles, dismount, fight, and then backtrack another 10 or 15 miles in the opposite direction as they're falling back and what wilson is doing is this excellent i mean if you look at the early phases of the campaign it's this excellent uh, uh period of just really trading space for time trying to get his army together trying to get his men together and then at the same time the forest is coming off of the november 7th campaigns down on the tennessee river he'd been at johnsonsville and then by the 14th, rejoined with the Army of Tennessee, then crossed back over the Tennessee River and begun probing, looking for the Army. Just those first week or two of the campaign are mind-boggling to think about how much movement is going on. And then to think that it all kind of comes to a head. You know, I'm sitting at my house. It's only 15 miles down to Columbia from here. It's all taking place right down there, just off to my right-hand side. Yeah. Now I got to back up to something you said, because as someone grounded in the wilderness and you talk about James Wilson's doing an excellent job, and that's a phrase we don't really use with James Wilson in the wilderness. Um, how is it that he, he, he gets his act together and, and is able to perform so much better uh, by the time he shows up there in Frank? Well, he doesn't have much of a choice. Um, he, I think the understanding is that he's got to do something just to slow down Forrest. And you're, again, you bring up a great point. He's a guy that comes to us from the East. He's out there with, with Jeb Stewart in this kind of traditional cavalry role. And then he gets out West. He's handed this cavalry department here in the Cumberland. And 
Thomas is relying on him. John Schofield is relying on him. It's not just relying on him for intelligence, but I think in large part, John Schofield is relying on Wilson really for his survival. Uh, Schofield is on the north bank of the Pigeon Roost Creek, just uh, north of Pulaski, and he's kind of hollowed the army away trying to protect the main body while Wilson is out both scouting and looking for forest, but also looking for Hood's main body. How he does it is, it's really beyond me Mm -hmm. because he's dealing not only with personality conflicts, he's not dealing with, you know, bickering so much, but just not knowing the men that he's dealing with and not knowing their experience, not knowing the necessarily the ground all that well, and then bringing together this kind of force just out of thin air, uh, gathering men from outside of Pulaski and then as far away over as um, uh, Henryville and over towards Campbellsville, kind of bringing men together across almost a, almost a 60 mile stretch back and forth across the state is I can't tell you exactly how he does it, but he does it very well. And really when he gets to Nashville, that's where he's going to have almost two weeks to build an army and build a cavalry force. And it's really on the back end of the campaign, the pursuit of, of hood that he'll really start to show, uh, I I guess what he's capable of out here. It's really cavalry. That's going to chase hood back to Franklin on the 17th of December. So it could, of course, that all puts things on the back end of the campaign. So maybe we'll have to do an episode on the, <laughs> the pursuit of the army. Yeah, that's uh, the 17th of December is, is really touch and go for, for his army. And to think that the Confederate army ends up back in Spring Hill that night. Yeah, yeah they're they're not having nightmares about <laughs> a, year, a couple of weeks earlier at all. No. Right, right. And, and how much of it, too, is it, you know, Wilson is thrown into combat with Forrest, who at this point of the war is as much myth as soldier. Oh, you know, there's, a, there's a reputation to all of that. And then he's his experience is against kind of the refined cavalrymen out east. And he comes out and there's there's Forrest, and he's not he's not alone in reputation. There's Chalmers' division is there. Abraham Buford has already gained a reputation. Uh, And there's all the legends and all the lore that kind of follow Forrest. But the one thing that I always have found really fascinating is that when you take a battlefield tour with us at Spring Hill, it's here's all the things that Forrest did wrong. But when you look at the early few weeks of the campaign, maybe we understand why he does things so just out of character when he gets to Spring Hill. He's just exhausted. Yeah. And his men are just exhausted. They've been on campaign for the better part of two months and he's sick. His brother had just been killed. He's got a wound that hadn't healed. Just coming off of the summer of 64 and that early fall of 64, golly, it's kind of a wonder that they were able to stay really composed at all through the 29th. We were filming today and one of the things I was talking about is just the superhuman efforts of both armies just to stay in the field at this point. I looked at some of the hills that we were walking today and I thought if I were 20 years old, having fought through three years, not on your life, but when there's somebody chasing behind you that wants to kill you, I guess you have a little bit more uh, umption to get moving. Whole different context there. (laughs) So why is it that there's not the battle of Columbia? Well, there is for the better part of, well, I, I, I suppose when we think of the Battle of Franklin, why doesn't that happen in Columbia? Well, it's a great question. It gets to the, the great myth about John Bell Hood is that all we hear is John Bell Hood, Mr. Frontal Assault, wants to attack, wants to always pierce right at the center, wants to throw men at earthworks. Well, he certainly wasn't doing that in Columbia. Uh, John Schofield and his army collide on the south bank of the Duck River and Schofield will cross his army over the duck and really by the evening of the 27th onto the 28th, John Schofield has crossed his army, has burned the, the bridges, has cut the pontoons, and already John Bell Hood is coming up with another plan. Mm-hmm. He had kind of laid out his three core, Ben Cheatham, A.P. Stewart, and S.D. Lee, and what he devises is his plan. He goes to all three of them, in addition, Forrest, and he lays out this plan for what's going to happen. It will be a flanking march. He's going to leave 10,000 men and the bulk of S.D. Lee's artillery behind 
on the south bank of the Duck River and then taking 20,000 men under the advice from his chief engineer, Colonel Stephen Pressman. They're going to take 20,000 men, shift them just to the east of Columbia, cross over the Davis Ford on the Duck River, and then begin this lengthy march. We could call it roughly 12 miles from the banks of the Duck River along the Davis Ford Road, which is one of the worst roads in the entire county. Then it was essentially a cattle pasture transfer road. It hadn't been used really by men or by wagons in close to 20 years. So you're looking at a road that's essentially dirt yeah. in a campaign where for the previous few weeks, it had been uh, this kind of wintry mix rain and, and just absolutely terrible conditions. I guess a good comparison might be a, like a drier version of the mud march. Okay. Uh, and yet by the 29th and the 30th, the temperatures are rising back up, the sun is out. And by five o'clock in the morning, the armies are on the move. John Bell Hood's two corps under Cheatham and Stewart, so roughly 20,000 men, begin this long flanking march. This is one of those things that goes against the notion that Hood wanted to attack and attack and attack. He wanted to be on the offensive, but he was going to do it in a way that would minimize casualties. Uh, that's the one thing about the campaign that he kind of had to guarantee to both Davis and Beauregard is that he would only give battle where he thought there could be an advantage on a field of advantage. And so this march is really a portion of that, is swinging men, as he would plan, behind John Schofield, 20,000 men to put behind him, 10,000 men and the Army's artillery to act as a diversion in Columbia. And who's to say that on the morning of November the 30th, the great what if is what if the battle happens in Spring Hill? Who's to say that the Battle of Franklin, as we know it, is really the Battle of Spring Hill the day before, that there's 20,000 men behind John Schofield, there's 10,000 men to the south. We don't know if John Schofield would have just surrendered or if he would have attempted to fight his way out. Um, there are numerous historians that have posited ideas about him taking his army on a, a wild flanking march of their own, trying to find another road. But the fact of the matter is, is that the Columbia Turnpike, today's U.S. Highway 31, now a paved four-lane highway, was at the time a macadamized road, so dirt and gravel packed. It was the best road that Schofield could have hoped for. Mm -hmm. That is the Army's lifeline. That's how they're going to get to Nashville and there's not going to be time to look around and I don't know if Hood knows that but by the afternoon of November the 29th he can tell because Schofield by mid-morning hours has already begun to move his guns and wagons out of Columbia I think he's realizing what's happening is he's not completely oblivious he's getting good infantry reports he's got uh reconnaissance report that comes to him from the duck river that says that there's troop movement and he'll begin to move those guns and wagons kind of the heavy stuff the uh, uh as one historian called it the impedimenta of the army and as they start to move north think about it if a wagon breaks down traffic jam gun breaks down traffic jam if you're trying to move an army quick you need that stuff out of the way so schofield gets it moving and then the Confederate Army and that wagon train plus one division uh, of infantry, the 4th Corps 2nd Division under George Wagner, uh, will collide in Spring Hill. Both uh, Forest Cavalry, Wagner's division will square off, and then later on in the day, Wagner and Patrick Claiborne's division will have a fight there of some consequence. And when you talk about Hood making this 12-mile flanking maneuver, he's not trying to get into the immediate rear of Schofield. He's really trying to cut him off. But why, is he to, why does he make 12 miles as opposed to just getting around Schofield? I think it's just it's where the road would very conveniently dump him off closest to the Columbia Pike. Mm -hmm. uh, the objective from the start is to block the road. Uh, get over to the Columbia Turnpike and block it. It's assumed maybe that that's just the only way that Schofield's going to get out. And Hood's looking to deny him that access of retreat. He's proven right when Schofield starts to evacuate the army on the Columbia Pike. And it's uh, sometime around, probably around two o'clock in the afternoon, just not 600 yards from where I'm sitting, uh, that Hood and his corps commander, Ben Cheatham, 
they're on the Davis Ford. They can actually see the Columbia Pike, which gets to another great controversy that comes up after the war between Hood and Cheatham is when could they see the road? Well, Hood tells us that he could see the road uh, outside of Spring Hill. Cheatham says that from the moment that we crossed the Duck River, the road was never in view. Who's right? Who's wrong? Well, walk the ground yourself and see. <laughs> I, I did it today and there's not one, but two or five different opportunities where you could see the Columbia Turnpike. And that's just on this side of Rutherford Creek. And that's just on this side uh, of what is now Bear Creek Pike that would have separated the armies. It's right there. And for a general with field glasses and or a, a telescope, it's very easy to see. Uh -huh. uh, traffic today is very quick and easy to pick out it would have would have been a lot easier to see wagons and guns with a trail of dust behind them moving up the road too so why is it the two of them get into a pissing match about that after the war who holds the bag the next morning on november the 30th from spring hills <laughs> got a lot to do with it <laughs> so the object is to cut the road and Hood's army gets up to Spring Hill with that objective in mind. Why don't they just march across and cut the road? They run into George Wagner's division. Uh, George Wagner had arrived just around 1130 in the morning, early afternoon deploys on the northeast and south edge of town through Brigade Front. Uh, Colonel Emerson Optex, 1st Brigade to the north edge of town, Colonel John Lane, Bad news for John Lane. If it's 12, he had only been in command of the army for, oh, since about 4 a.m. <laughs> He'd only been in command of that brigade since about 4 a.m., rather. Um, he had replaced William Groves, who had been promoted to another division. So Lane's there, and then to the south edge of town is Brigadier General Luther Bradley's brigade. They're posted off of what is to now, today, a preserved section of the battlefield. Uh, thanks largely to the efforts of the American Battlefield Trust. Um, no sooner do they arrive than does Forest Cavalry arrive off of the Lewisburg Turnpike, kind of crossing the span on what was then the Mount Carmel Pike today is close to a duplex road. They arrive, they run right into Lane's brigade, and Lane for his first day does very well for himself, throws back Forest Cavalry uh, three times and will push forest men back down the rally hill pike and they'll move to the caldwell house and this is where one of the first great mysteries of the day comes about is why isn't there a better job of relaying information between forest cavalry and hood's army which is coming up the same road davis ford connects into rally hill and rally hill takes them into spring hill why doesn't someone go down and tell hood what to expect and tell him what's in front of them it's unclear how much anybody knows when they arrive here sometime around 3.30. And then, of course, bringing up that advanced element of the army is Pat Claiborne's division. If you're looking for the tip of the spear, look no further. It's Claiborne's men, hardest fighting, some of the best trained, some of the most veteran troops. They begin to move sort of north and north uh, west off of the Rally Hill Pike towards Spring Hill and uh, Mark P. Lowry's right flank of his brigade will slam right into Bradley's men and there starts this this fight a uh I think what a lot of people have called the incident at Spring Hill or the affair at Spring Hill really discounted the fact that there was a battle and men's lives were on the line and it was a serious fight for them they didn't think of it as just some minor scrap or a skirmish that gets the blood boiling when I hear that it's somebody says Oh, it was, it was just a minor skirmish. Well, it was a minor skirmish with a lot on the line, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and not to get us too off track, because your narrative is just fantastic here, dude. You're knocking on the park for me. Um, but, but, but I, you know, that, that whole minimizing it as the incident, the affair, um, like there, there, there's a political agenda behind that characterization in post-war memory to try to downplay it as much as it is. And it's by both sides, which is, I think incredible is why would John Schofield not want to take credit for what I think we could argue is the most daring escape in the history of the United States army. Mm -hmm. He says was a very little incident at all. 
maybe it's maybe it's to cover his backside for being in Colombia and being that exposed, or maybe it's that he didn't evacuate the army earlier. Maybe he's just trying to downplay that, but I don't know if I was John Schofield, I would want to hang my hat on having conducted that. He's certainly proud enough of it to say uh, that great quote. He says that hood went to sleep and I stayed in the saddle all night overseeing the important movement of my troops but then a few pages later, when he's refuting something that another corps commander says, he simply says that it was there was no serious danger at all that night. Well, yeah, sure. <laughs> everybody else seems to disagree. I guess it's a convenient way to downplay it. But then when it comes to the battle uh, on the Confederate side of it, when it comes to the events that come out of it, they almost tend to fixate on it. Because nobody, I mean, it's just a, a massive game of, uh, you know, on, on tours, I'm sometimes comfortable saying it turns into a game of he said, she said, and it's just this nonstop ping, finger pointing and accusation being tossed here and accusation being tossed there. Uh, but I want to dive into that in a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Been tough to come. <laughs> so Claiborne um, gets there. They have this opening engagement. How do things pan out? As uh, forces they class? run right into each other. Bradley's brigade will feud or will, will uh, hold their position just for a few minutes. I mean, by the time Claiborne realizes what's happening, he brings up the balance of his division. Uh, throws Govan's brigade into the fight. Now it's Govan and Lowry. They'll drive off Bradley. Bradley is actually severely wounded in the fight, um, shot through the arm. He's removed from the field. So his brigade breaks. They're just simply being overrun. Claiborne's division is pounding down on top of them, and they take off running back towards the town of Spring Hill, back towards the federal artillery positions. And that's when uh, batteries from the 4th Corps of the Army of the Cumberland really just they plaster Claiborne's men as they're advancing across the hills uh, to the southeast of the town, and Claiborne's division's attack kind of stalls. So simultaneously, uh, William Bates' division is advancing across the fields just over the backside of Ripa Villa. Uh, he's got almost two miles of ground to cover, and it's open, it's farmland, but then he's going to run into some creek bed here, uh, Johnson's Branch Creek there, and He's got some ravines to traverse. And by the time his men come through the other side, they're talking about how they had, they had gone through two creek beds. They had advanced over this open ground and I couldn't have picked a better day to record this. I literally walked it this morning. <laughs> uh, there were moments where I was looking at some of the ground. I was thinking, you know, if you're moving an entire 2,100 man division, a four brigade front crossing over this ground, you're not all getting to the same places at the same time. There's this kind of staggering. It's difficult to keep dressing those individual companies, much less magnify that to an entire division. And then you're crossing this rough terrain. But Bate has a clear shot. He's 300 yards away from the road, and he's with Hood. And Hood tells him, throw your division on the road. Hood hears everything that's happening with Claiborne's division. He rides off, Bates moving towards the road, and a message comes from Ben Cheatham, the Corps commander. And he wants Bates to fall back, halt, pull his right flank to attach to Claiborne's left. And now, all of a sudden, William Bates is in a very, very uh, confusing, I would maybe argue, um, stressful situation to have to make a decision. Because he's got Hood telling him to block the road, and he's got his Corps commander telling him to fall back. Well, who's he going to listen to? So he sends a message to cheat him. And this all comes out of a report that's not actually in the ORs. It's published later in uh, Edwin Drake's Annals of the Army of Tennessee. But uh, Bates says that he essentially sends this message off to cheat him. He asks, I would sum it up as, are you sure? <laughs> uh, I have orders to block the road. You're telling me to fall back. What should I do? Cheat him tells Bates, in short, fall back or face arrest. Wow. That makes things very easy for William Bate. He pulls his 20 month, 2,100 men away from uh, the road. But what's really interesting is when you're standing on the ground where that happened, you're 250, 300 yards away from the road, you can see it. Uh, Not only can you see it straight ahead of you, you can see it to the south. 
which means that you could also very easily be seen. And around three o'clock in the afternoon on November the 29th, John Schofield orders the rest of the army out of Columbia. And as it's starting to get dark, Bates' division's advancing across the field and sitting just about a mile south is Thomas Ruger's division, of the 23rd Corps of the Army of the Ohio. I don't know that I could say for sure that Ruger could see Bate or that Bate could see Ruger. Um, Bate would later say that he knew there was something to the south. I think a lot of people wish they could say that they knew something on the 29th, but Bate has probably the best argument when you walk the ground and you see it for yourself. He's got probably the best argument to make that he could see or hear something at least operating to the south of him. And what it is, is it's, it's Schofield's whole army moving up from Columbia. Um, another division is brought up on his left at Allegheny Johnson. Uh, of course, a, a great friend of yours out east, Johnson gets here and um, he deploys just to the left of bait. And now it's dark. And I think Ambrose Bierce maybe says it best. The fires were glowing red hot in the distance and we could see them. Uh, there's another soldier that says here was Schofield's little army advancing up the road and they made no attempt to stop us. Yeah. And having stood on that ground myself, I couldn't believe how close Bates men were to the road. <laughs> I mean, it just it blew my mind. every blew, day. It, Yeah. It blew my mind. And then I to see, have, I see people on tour and you show them you're pointing to where Bates division was and they can see the road. And the number one question that we get immediately at that moment is, well, how did they screw this up? Yeah. <laughs> Everything comes <laughs> apart. You're looking at a campaign that had been almost textbook in terms of execution. All the wheels come off at Spring Hill. Yeah. And, and Hood is not there to exercise personal leadership on the battlefield because he rides off and then finds a headquarters you know, behind the lines and, you know, why isn't he playing a more direct active role in, in how things are finally playing out? Well, he's got a hell of a fine corps commander in Ben Cheatham. Now, granted, he'd only been on the job a few months, but Cheatham's a veteran, almost beloved by his men. He's a brawler. He's a fighter. He's got a proven reputation. Um, Hood is, I think, like any army commander and keep in mind where he learns to be an army commander is under Lee and what does Douglas Southall Freedom, uh, Freeman tell us in both Lee's lieutenants and in Lee's biography he tells us that Lee exercises this kind of tenet of leadership where he allows his subordinates to be the one in charge he gives them the plan he tells them how to execute it but he's not going to be there with them holding their hand as they execute it now of course the great kind of pitfall of that is that Lee had Longstreet and Jackson and Hood. Hood has Cheatham and Stewart, both fine and, and capable officers, but different calibers, right? right? Different whole ball teams. That's the major leagues. And we're looking at, you know, a minor league team here. Batting averages are different the entirety. Well, Hood makes his headquarters just to the south of where Ripa Villa is now on Denning Lane, uh, makes his headquarters at the Thompson House, Oakland. And he's there throughout the night. And the story is, is that um, now it depends who you believe. Ben Cheatham says that this meeting never occurred. Hood insists that it did. Uh, where Cheatham comes to Hood and Hood asks the question, are your men in position to block the road? And Cheatham responds in the affirmative. That's what Hood says. Now, Cheatham refuses to acknowledge that that's how the conversation played out, if it played out at all. Um, this is where you get some of the great guides and the great uh, narrative writers and some academic historians that have studied this campaign that say that Hood was simply lying or that Cheatham was simply lying. It's who do we believe? I think the evidence is kind of points in Hood's favor is that would he have gone to sleep not knowing that the road was blocked? Well, he was assured of it. Cheatham said he was in position to block the road. Then Cheatham leaves and AP Stewart talks to Hood at some point that evening and tells him that his men are just off of the road. They have been placed in position that night. And this is all kind of following what had really broken down throughout the evening. 
this fight to take Spring Hill, which was not at all what Hood had set out to do. Hood had set out to block the road. And now Ben Cheatham kind of exercising his own independent command now with John Calvin Brown's division, with Patrick Claiborne's division, with William Bates' division, I guess almost fixates on the fact that there's still a federal infantry division in town. And so he pushes uh, with Brown and with Claiborne and with Bate. But the, the trick of it all is that Brown has to kick off the assault. He has to start it. But where Brown's positioned, he's 800 feet from John Lane's brigade. He doesn't know how far to the right they extend. He's afraid that his flank is overlapped. So he hesitates. It's dark. Uh, his men had marched roughly 18 miles that day. Then there's Claiborne's division, which is just off to their left, that had marched the same distance and had fought all afternoon. They're exhausted from adding that. And then you've got Bates' division, who I almost kind of imagine as this chained up dog rearing to go at the road. And yet they've been kind of hauled back and tied down to the tree. And it's stay here and wait your turn. And how I, I we perceive the attack would have gone is that Brown's division would have led Claiborne on hearing Brown's guns would have advanced and then Bate might have blocked the road. Well, there's the great what if right there is what if that starts? Who knows? Who knows if two divisions is enough to throw back Wagner's single division, about 5,600 men and some artillery, could that have been enough to tip the balance, enough to tip the scales? Who knows? Um, what is clear is that Brown never begins the attack, so Claiborne never moves, so Bate never moves, so they don't block the road. They're encamped. It's dark. Campfires start to be pitched. Cheatham has his meeting with Hood. Then Stewart shows up, uh, as I was mentioning, and he's been given a guide from Cheatham's corps, and he tells Hood, essentially, you know, we're several hundred yards away from the road. My men are exhausted. At, at this moment, I've left them in bivouac. Should I advance upon the road? And Hood, in summary, tells Cheatham, or tells Stuart, rather, that we'll advance on the road in the morning. We'll advance on Franklin in the morning. Allow your men to rest. Now, Hood wouldn't have just told Stuart that without some assurance that the road had been blocked. Right. So Stuart leaves, and Forrest Cavalry throws a small barricade, some of Red Jackson's men, uh, on the north side of town, but Jackson's men, again, out of ammunition, tired, hungry, exhausted, been in the saddle since about four in the morning. They're not going to be worth any, uh, you know, equivalent of a fighting force when something does happen. Right. And then along comes John Schofield, who, I mean, for a man that is not, uh, not prone to taking risks, here he is on what I think is one of the gutsiest decisions he'll ever have to make in his entire career. This is a man whose career spans, what, 47 years in the Army? I think this is the night that defines his life, maybe. Off he goes. And Off it's, he goes. And, you know, and, and you talk about the great what if and if the assault had, had, had gone forward. But I even think, you know, if Bate had just advanced to, to cross the road, not even in conjunction with attacks to the north, you know, it's a single the division. Potential, yeah, you know, the, the, the potential um, that, you know, may have unfolded for the Confederacy there. And I'm not getting into lost cause porn and ooh, what if this, what if that? But it's just like there are just so many contingencies. It's a great, it's a great question is what if there was just a division in the way? Because when, when Thomas Ruger starts forward, Silas Strickland's brigade's in the lead. There's two regiments of brand new troops that have never been in action before right behind two pretty veteran regiments. They're going to run right into a couple of skirmishers here. But what if they ran into the entire the entirety of William Bates' division? Four brigades strong. And you're looking at some of the, I think, some of the best troops in the Army. And there's William Bates. I mean, they don't call him fighting Billy for nothing. Uh, he's in position. He could have straddled the road, but he didn't. He's about 300 yards off of the road, 200 yards off of the road. And Ruger starts this kind of slow procession up from the south edge. He's advancing towards town. They arrive in Spring Hill, almost entirely unmolested. And Schofield goes to Ruger and essentially says, let's try moving north. They get to Thompson Station. The dramatic episode that plays out there is that they had crossed into Spring Hill. They had gotten out of Spring Hill on the north side of town. 
Schofield turns to one of his aides, a captain named William Twinning, and he hands Twinning a message. He says, get this to the telegraph office in Franklin. And it's 1897 when John Schofield uh, recalls what he intended with that message. He's sending Twinning ahead to see if the road's blocked. Yeah. And he said, I sat silently in the saddle and I listened as his hoofs faded out. And when they did, I knew the road to Franklin was open. Twinning delivers that message. It's transmitted. It's in the official record. I think it's listed at around 10 o'clock in the evening. So he gets to Franklin, sends it through, and Schofield sends Ruger forward right after Twinning kind of fades off. Ruger goes, and then he returns back to town. I mean, this is a general in command of an army riding literally hundreds of yards away from a sleeping adversary. Uh, as one soldier said, our mighty foe. And there's John Schofield riding with just his staff back and forth. And he gets down to Spring Hill. He transmits the message, sends the message back down to Jacob Cox, tells Cox, bring up, bring up the rest. Keep on. Let's go. So Cox's division goes, then uh, Kimball's division goes, then Wood's division goes. And everyone is passing through in the middle of the night. There are uh, stories of federal soldiers simply stumbling off the road, thinking that maybe that's Wagner's division. That might be the Second Division's troops right there. So they're going, they're sitting around campfires, they're being taken prisoner. There are stories of Confederate soldiers who are walking out, walking out onto the, the road thinking maybe that's William Bates' division uh, or simply just being kind of picked up, and carried on to in the federal column. There's a great, a great quote that comes out of it uh, where a Confederate kind of stumbled into the ranks of a federal regiment. And he said, my God, you can't be Yankees. That's our camp right there. And the only response he got was, you are our prisoner. And they just kept on moving. Um, one of the, I think, the most incredible kind of encounters is between a captain named Dick English. He's in Hiram Granberry's brigade, Claiborne's division. He stumbles out on the road, picked up, brought to David Stanley's headquarters and uh, Stanley, the fourth corps commander is interviewing him and he described English as being very saucy, uh, arrogant and assured that there would be a victory the next day. Well, there would be a victory. It would just be for Schofield's army. Uh, and all of that is unfolding right there in the dark as there are reports being made and, you know, a private hears something and tells his sergeant. A sergeant tells a captain. A captain tells a major. A major tells a colonel. The colonel tells the general. Eventually, one of those generals ends up being Ed Johnson. Johnson goes and apparently he hears Cheatham remonstrating against night attacks. He talks with Hood. Uh, and the order is given for Johnson to bring his division out onto the road. But by the time they get there, the Federal Army's gone. He either encounters a gap in the army, which I doubt, or they're just gone, and he missed them by a hair. Mm. It's, close. It's, one of, it's, it's one of those things that's like so obviously bold or boneheaded. It can't possibly be going on, and yet it is. Exactly, and I think that's when people ask how. Well, I could get into the science of environmental factors, um, uh, sound absorption through the wetness and the humidity in the air, uh, sound pollution in terms of conversations and kind of that white noise of a camp. But then there's also just, it had never been done before. And these guys, these men are going to sleep that night thinking the last thing on earth that's coming through their mind is that Schofield's army could just escape from Columbia. They're thinking about how easy the victory will be. Uh, one of the soldiers that we talked about today, Edward Morris, wrote that when they went to sleep that night, they were totally assured that victory awaited them in the morning. That's what they go to sleep thinking. That's what John Bell Hood goes to sleep thinking. Yeah, He's thinking, I'll wake up, put on my uniform, get saddled up and ride out to the road and there will be John Schofield. And he could take his West Point classmate surrender. Yeah. But all of that fades into a, almost a pipe dream as the sun starts to come up. And some of the first warning signs that really become apparent for the Confederate Army is that Allenson Cutting, he's an engineer on the Nashville and Decatur railway lines that run through Spring Hill, he'd been ordered to set his train cars on fire. He's carrying the baggage of some of the federal regiments, brand new ones, the 44th Missouri, Buck 83rd Ohio, and the 175th Ohio. 
Uh, so there's a great big ball of fire off on the west side of town. There are the last troops from George Wagner's division crossing over the creeks on the north side of town. And if those are the Confederates on the north edge from A.P. Stewart's Corps, hundreds of yards away from the road, they're starting to see things, they're starting to hear things, they're starting to smell things. Uh, there's no hard and fast account, but those soldiers that slept opposed to Lane's brigade, they were only 800 feet away from John Lane's men. They heard it, they could smell it, and then there's just, there's the fact that there's camps that are just abandoned, there's detritus of every category, knapsacks, blankets, extra jackets, uh, crates, boxes, anything of the, an army on the move in a panic is left on the side of the road. There's wagons that are overturned. They'll find horses in the road too. All of a sudden it, it, it all starts to click uh, over in John Calvin Brown's division. Ellis and Capers and States Rights Gist, they ride out to the road and Capers is talking about how they could see the, the trail of an army or something to that effect. It, clearly it had happened, but nobody could really figure it out in that moment. It wasn't Schofield got away. It was, well, maybe it's just the Federals that are here yeah. and Spring Hill are gone. Well, at two in the morning, S.D. Lee's down in Columbia. He wrote that there was no enemy to his front at two in the morning. So even he's starting to pick your, pick it all, put it all together. And then the picture's becoming a little bit more clear. And by we could assume that Hood is up by five. He had been awake at four o'clock in the morning the previous day. And this is by far the signature move of his entire career playing out. Uh, he's awake by five, in the saddle by 5.30. And by six, he has to meet with someone to figure out what happened. And that someone is Benjamin Cheatham. Hmm. thus all of the recriminations and finger pointings and uh who's holding the bags so. it starts it starts there and who holds the bag I, I don't know if you ask my opinion i think there's blame to go around across the entire command structure sure. um, ultimately you know everybody's cop-out answers ultimately it rests with hood um, <laughs> i would say it it goes across every division commander every brigade commander all the core commanders, it's Stewart, it's Cheatham, uh, it's Brown, it's Bate, it's Claiborne, it's uh, it's Gist, it's Carter, it's, it's all of them. They're all getting a little piece of it. And then take it a step further, it goes down to the individual ranks of soldiers and it goes into those some of those junior level field officers. And does it rest with Hood? I mean, he's, he's in command of the army. It, it's his baby, it's his plan. Yeah. But I think he does he does more than a fair job after the campaign ends and taking ownership for it. He says that he was alone in its conception. That's him. Mm -hmm. uh, he strived in his utmost to see its execution. That's him. Uh, Spring Hill, I, I think, is one of the great mysteries. Largely, I think sometimes we, we've we've overcomplicated it to the point where we've made it the mystery at Spring Hill when really Hard and fast, the Confederate Army just fails to secure its objective. And John Schofield does something that no one in the world could ever have expected. Yeah. So, I, I always have thought of Spring Hill as one of the great Homer Simpson moments of the war where Hood wakes up and says, go! Oh! Um, Absolutely. And, and, and you know, that, that puts a much... Um, a much too light spin on it, knowing what happens the next day at Franklin. Um, you know, there's a real tragedy to what happens at Spring Hill because it directly leads to the Battle of Franklin. Uh, how do you, what, what's your final assessment of the events at Spring Hill? Uh, I think that, and I, I think I echo a lot of previous writers and kind of the current mood and mode of interpretation is that Spring Hill we often talk about Nashville being kind of the, the finishing blow to the army of Tennessee. It will never go on another offensive after this campaign. Well, if that's the conclusion, Franklin is the body. Spring Hill is the forward of that. Mm -hmm. Everything that's happening, everything that had happened so far. I mean, if we think about the context in which the campaign takes place, it's November of 1864. 
The war had been going on for three years. We could safely assume there's 600,000 dead already. There's still another six months left to go. And here's this action. And John Bell Hood, for the first, we could give him credit and say the first two or three weeks of the campaign, has just been an absolute fear in the hearts of John Schofield and of George Thomas. And I think look no further than Ulysses S. Grant's messages to Thomas in those two weeks preceding Nashville is here's Hood's army, destroy it, destroy it, destroy it, do something, do something. It shows you that Hood was not some idle threat that everybody was willing to just kind of throw away. He crosses the river. He conducts this brilliant campaign to Spring Hill. But Spring Hill is the ultimate tragedy, not because of a Confederate defeat, not because of what happens in terms of his army kind of falling apart. It's this ultimate tragedy because there's roughly 2,200 men that will both march on the Columbia Turnpike and sleep in those fields uh, around town that will never see another sunset again. This is it. This is their final night on earth. They're seeing Rip of Villa. They're seeing the Columbia Turnpike. They're in the Confederate Army. They're sleeping in the fields to the, the east and to the, uh, uh, the south of town. There are stories of husbands that will never see their wives and their children again. And there's the great human tragedy in that is that it all unfolds the very next day at Franklin. Five hours of fighting, some of the most brutal combat in the entire war. Uh, you know, people ask, oh, is it like Gettysburg? Is it like uh, Chancellorsville? Is it like uh, Fredericksburg? No, I, I couldn't compare it to any of those because I, I, honest to goodness, I think that it is worse. Yeah. Uh, it is an explosion of three years of fighting between these armies, the Army of the Cumberland and the Army of Tennessee, the Army of the Ohio. All of that unfolds right here in this little stretch from Spring Hill on to Franklin. Yeah. And it's that morning where the plan is made. The armies are on the move. And just within hours, John Bell Hood will deploy some 20,000 men to strike the federal position at Franklin. And there we'll break out. We'll see 10,000 casualties killed, wounded, and missing in five hours of fighting. Wow. So that starts in Spring Hill. And I, I, we started with this, and I love to finish it with it. To understand Franklin, you really need to get on the ground in Spring Hill. You need to read about it. You need to walk the ground. You need to uh, take a tour down here, battlefield tour, house tour, regardless. Uh, visit the Battle of Franklin Trust sites and really take it in uh, what unfolded here over that, that such a critical period, November the 29th and the 30th. And that actually leads to my final question. And, uh, you know, the, the battlefield at Franklin tends to get a lot of attention because of how much of it has been reclaimed, but there's actually ground you can walk down in Spring Hill. Uh, for someone who goes down to Spring Hill, um, what, what can folks see? What can they experience? Uh, well, there's two sections of preserved battlefield, really, I guess we could say three. Um, there's the 90 plus acres that rip a villa in terms of what the Battle of Franklin Trust now operates. That's a section of the battlefield because it's where troops move. I mean, that's the great debate is what's a battlefield? Well, is it just where troops form up? Is it just where they fight? I think it's all of the above. So Ripa Villa is a portion of it. Um, there's the preserve section directly north of Ripa Villa that the American Battlefield Trust owns. That's uh, a section, again, another 90 plus tract of land. Uh, that's largely where some of William Bates' men and Edward Johnson's men will encamp that night. And then on the other side of Saturn Parkway, there's a preserved section of battlefield over which some of the maneuvering for that hardest fighting uh, of the day with Claiborne and Bradley's brigades, or Claiborne's division and Bradley's brigades, rather, uh, takes place over on off of Kedron Road. Uh, all of that, I think, is incredibly crucial. And, you know, there's always more ground that you wish could be saved and more portions of the battle to, to be able to interpret through battlefield reclamation, which I, I think Chris is one of the, the great victories of the partnership between the Battle of Franklin Trust, the American Battlefield Trust, and all of the different nonprofit entities and individual donors that have stepped forward to contribute money to save portions of the battlefield. I can, 
I can speak as someone who saw portions of the Franklin battlefield before they were saved right. and sees them now and works on them now it is so much easier to understand some of the things that took place there and to think that the ground directly to the north of Ripavilla um, in 2008, following the economic collapse, there was plans to actually put in a development, strip malls and everything there. And the American Battlefield Trust stepped in, bought the land. Uh, and now, I mean, we're post-harvest season. So the soybeans that are normally planted there, they're gone. And now to be able to walk on that ground, I, I told you we did that today. Golly, it is, wow. it's just incredible. Yeah. It is an amazing piece of land. You stand there and you just shake your head and you wonder about yeah. all of this. Yeah. yeah. Joe, I've had a great time talking with you tonight. You've been fantastic. And, and I, it's been a real privilege to listen to you tell this story. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to do this, to talk about this. I mean, you talk about it every day, but Oh, what's another hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> Folks can support the Battle of Franklin Trust. Check them out online. They're doing some fantastic work. Joe's doing some great work there as part of their team. Joe, thanks for being with us today. Absolutely, Chris. Thank you. We'll see you online and on the battlefield.